Hello everybody. Earlier this year I did a presentation on personal computers and I'd like to add an addendum to my guide. I kind of glossed over or just totally skipped some things about monitors and I want to make some corrections here so that the guide will be a little bit more comprehensive. So before we begin I'd like to make a quick correction. On OLED monitors I mentioned that they have longevity issues and that they cost quite a lot, which are both true but it's not quite the whole picture. Related to the longevity issues is their brightness. They cannot get very bright because if they do, it will damage the OLEDs or at least damage them quicker. So because of that, most LED monitors are not allowed to get very bright. So if you say have a very bright office at work or maybe at home, you may not want to get an OLED monitor as it probably will not get bright enough to counteract the sun's light. Also, OLED monitors usually consume quite a lot of power. So if you live somewhere where power is expensive, like let's say Europe, you might not want to get an, a monitor that's expensive and you might have to replace it and it also uses a lot of expensive power. Okay, so the first question we probably want to ask is what the heck's the contrast ratio? So the contrast ratio is the difference between how bright and dark the monitor can get at the same time. So for example, if there's say like a white section of the screen or you know very bright section and there's black or you know very dark section of the screen, it's the difference between those two. Now you might think, well surely every monitor can just show pure white and pure black at the same time, right? Well, not necessarily. Okay, so here are some gradients, and depending on the display that you're using to view these, they might not quite all look the same. Now, for me on my IPS monitor that I'm using for this presentation, I can see pretty clearly a box on all of the white ones. But on the red one and the blue one, that's definitely not true. So I'm gonna draw some lines for you here. This is about where it looks for me. Actually, this orange line maybe should be over here a little bit, but uh, when I edited these, I didn't have all these on the screen at the same time. So because all these are on the screen at the same time, it's kind of throwing off uh, how each of these look. But yeah, for me, this whole section over here is about the same color, or at least it blends together pretty well. Whereas up here, like I said, on the white line, I can see them all separately. Now, this part over here on the red and the blue section, I don't know if that's oversaturation or if it's a contrast. If someone knows, please let me know in the comments. But yeah, on the red, I can see you know, it goes over to about here and then everything looks quote unquote black to me. So on the blue section, it just all kind of looks like a dark blue, like over here. It maybe gets a little darker over here, but I can't see like a clear line on any of these. So this is a problem that IPS monitors have is they just don't show contrast really great. Okay, so let's take a look at how IPS and all LCD monitors work. Here's a diagram of an LCD, which stands for liquid crystal display, by the way. For contrast ratio, the main place I want to focus on is the backlight, which provides illumination to all the pixels. Now the pixels are actually going to be on layer two, if I'm not mistaken, and then the light will come through. All, now these are polarizers. I don't know if those are actually on monitors or if it's just in this diagram, but I'm assuming they're probably still there. So layer three here is the actual liquid crystal, and they'll be a little different depending on which type of LCD it is, whether that be TN, IPS, or VA. So this will determine what color the backlight appears to be on that pixel, and then this will determine how much light comes through. So if, a, if, a scene, if part of the scene needs to be darker, then it'll block more light, or if it needs to be brighter, then it'll let through as much light as possible. So let's take a look at an example real quick. Let's say we have a very bright scene that's, you know, really bright. Let's say it's in the desert outside, which is pretty bright. Well, it's, maybe it's a western. And let's say the camera pans and now there's a cliff shadow that is getting cast. Now you'll notice that I've changed this color to not be white anymore. And that's because the backlight needs to provide illumination for all of the pixels. It needs to adjust somewhere in the middle between these two brightness levels. So it's not going to show the cliff shadow as dark as it should be, and it's not going to show the outside as bright as it should be. Okay, let's take a look at another example for how a scene might look. Let's say there's a really bright scene, there's like some shadow, and then there's like a much darker scene, a much darker part of the scene. Now this might need to appear almost black, for example, but again, because of how LCD monitors work, there's no way this is going to be dark enough. And if this scene was like very dark and this one was like, you know, dark, but not quite as dark, it might be hard to tell the difference between these two on an LCD monitor. Okay, that said, let's take a look at some contrast ratios. OLED monitors are said to not even have a contrast ratio because they can tr control each pixel individually so they can have no illumination on a pixel directly next to one that has full illumination. Now there might be some bleed over, but even if we get like a couple more pixels over, there really shouldn't be any bleed over. So it can show, you know, as dark as it possibly can be next to pure white, there won't really be any problem with that. 
Now IPS displays only have usually a 800 to 1100 to one. That's usually how contrast ratios are listed. There'll be a number to one. So it could be a thousand to one, 10,000 to one, a million to one, whatever. Some LED monitors will actually say they have quote unquote like a billion to one or something like that, but that's not really accurate. Now, whereas IPS monitors are weak at contrast ratios, this is where VA panels come in, and they usually have quite a bit better contrast ratio. Now, it's not as good as OLEDs, of course, not even close, but it's still significantly better than IPS monitors. Now, if you've been thinking about how we might solve this backlight problem, you might think, well, hey, we can just segment the backlight, right? And actually, yes, we can. There are monitors that will say to have a mini LED backlight, or they'll be said to have a number of local dimming zones. And this really crude example here, we would have eight local dimming zones. Now that's pretty poor and usually monitors will have hundreds of local dimming zones, but it's going to be hard for me to draw on this diagram like 300 local dimming zones. So you're just going to have to bear with me. So with the idea of the mini LED or segmented backlight in mind, you might think I'll just get an IPS monitor with local dimming zones and that'll fix all my problems. Well, unfortunately, the mini LED backlight can only enhance what's already there. And admittedly, I only looked at a, a few things that our teams had reviewed. We'll talk about them more in a second. So here are some examples. So yeah, see the IPS contrast ratio doesn't really get that much better, but the BA contrast ratio can get quite a lot better. Now, it depends on the mini LED backlight because sometimes even on the BA panels, they went from like 4,000 to 4,500 or like the IPS panel went from like 1,100 to 1,200 or 1,300. So it's not always guaranteed to make it significantly better. That 15,000 to one there is on a very, very, very expensive VA panel we're gonna look at in a second. And part of that is because most mini LED backlights don't have that many local dimming zones. So it's kind of hard to show, especially right next to each other, uh, say black and white. As technology improves and we get you know, more local dimming zones like 1,000, 2,000, you know, et cetera, these, these numbers will probably get better. And right now, I know some companies are developing IPS panels that have quote unquote true black, not really, they just have like 2000 to one, which is a lot better. And if those got combined with a mini LED backlight, might be pretty significant. But right now, those technologies aren't available. So if we want to have a really good contrast, we either got to go OLED or VA. And you might think, oh, well, I'll just get a VA panel with a mini LED backlight and that'll solve all my problems. Well, unfortunately, VA panels do have an Achilles heel as well. And as you probably guessed by the video title, it's the response time. So of course, the first thing we probably wanna ask is what is response time? Response time is how quickly a pixel can change its color to another color. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, there's a whole lot of colors that can potentially get displayed. Isn't that gonna be a lot of different measurements? And you are absolutely right. However, a lot of times you'll see monitors say, oh, there's a one millisecond gray to gray MPRT. That literally does not mean anything. That's one transition at one refresh rate. That tells you absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, to accurately describe the response time of a panel, we're gonna need not just one chart, but probably at least three charts, and that can be kind of tedious to go over. They could, of course, tell you the actual averages, but it'd make them look a lot worse, but it'd be more realistic. So we're gonna look at a whole bunch of charts. Hopefully that's okay. So to start things off, we're gonna look at an LG OLED monitor. I know there's a lot of data on here. I'm gonna break it down. First up, I'm gonna have the price up there in the top left in red. And all these charts are gonna be from rtings.com, which I recommend you check out, or Hardware Unboxed. It'll, if it's Hardware Unboxed, it'll look different than this. You'll, you'll be able to tell. So the first thing here is up the top. We're gonna to see the who makes it and what model this is. And you're also gonna see the refresh rate up there, which is 240 for this OLED. That's gonna be important because oftentimes as you lower the refresh rate, let's say your graphics card can't quite keep up with 240 Hz, then the response time is usually gonna get worse. This is not the best example to use because almost all the transitions are pretty much the same. They're within like you know tenths of a millisecond of each other. But at the bottom here, we can see the average as well as the best and the worst. And again, on this one, there's very little difference. So this might not be the best example. Okay, so let's talk about how to actually read the chart. First up, you do not read columns. Columns do, are not anything. They can compare rows, but you don't read columns. You only read a row. So for example, this row is going from no color in a pixel to up to the maximum over here on the far right. Pixels have three subpixels, one for blue, one for red, and one for green. And then if they need to say like to display purple, then there'll be some mix of blue and red. And then of course the bottom row here is going from full color. So that could be like white or red down to say black. 
Now, if you wanted to do, say, full red to full blue, then we'd have to do both the top row and bottom row, and whichever one's slower is the one we would see. So in this case, the transition from full red to no red would be longer because it takes 0.4 versus 0.3 there in the top right. Okay, let's take a look at this panel at 120 hertz. And you'll see there at the top, for some reason, that one transition is now 8 millisecond. I'm not sure if that was a glitch in the test, or I don't know how many test passes they run. I'm going to assume that's valid, but that's so weird. I feel like that's got to be a glitch, so I don't know if I'd take that as fact. Okay, let's take a look at an IPS panel. This is an LG IPS panel, and you'll see up there it says OD fast. OLED monitors do not have any sort of overdrive setting, but LCD ones do, and you can play with that to adjust the response time. Now this panel's pretty typical. It has generally pretty good response time. You notice the bottom three rows there kind of struggles to go from high color to low color. And that seems pretty typical from LCD monitors. So you even see it on some OLED panels. Now of course it's not as bad as this, but it'll still be significantly worse than the average. Now the response time for this panel is pretty decent at 180 hertz, but what happens if you can only play at say 120 hertz? Now it gets a lot worse. <laughs> There's very little green on here. It's pretty much all yellow. So this is, it's not terrible. This is still probably pretty good as far as most monitors are concerned. But if we're looking at, you know, top monitors for response time, this is definitely not going to be in there. So we looked at an OLED monitor for response time and an IPS monitor for response time. Let's take a look at four different VA panels for response time. And hopefully you'll see what I mean when I say it's the Achilles heel. So here is a very affordable Acer VA panel. And you're going to notice pretty quickly there's lots of red on the chart. And the difference between the best and the worst is very high. It's over 10 times as bad. And you'll also notice it struggles to go from pretty much any amount of color to not quite zero. Now, of course, you might not be able to run this monitor at 170 hertz all the time. So what if it's at 120 hertz, let's say? Oh, yeah, it got, it got pretty noticeably worse, didn't it? Well, actually, I think some of those got better. Yeah, actually, some of those got better. But on average, it got quite a bit worse. So... Yeah, if you get a, a relatively affordable VA panel, you might have some experience like this. So here's the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7, and as you can see, it's generally pretty good. There are some not so great transitions in there, like these 14s down here, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty solid. But this is 165 hertz. What if you can't quite handle that? Well, okay, it's a fair bit worse than 120 hertz, but it's still not terrible. We don't have anything above a 15, so that's certainly an improvement. But can we get any better? Well, yeah, if we want to spend $1,600 on the Odyssey Neo G9, I'm not sure why it's, what's, it's, this is the Odyssey Neo G9, I don't know why it's labeled. And it's actually really good. Pretty much all the transitions are, you know, sub 10. We got a, got an 11 down here basically, but for the most part, it's pretty solid. This is one of the best VA panels you can get for a response time, but of course you're going to have to pay for it. And this is a super ultra wide 2160p. So the, the chance you can run this at 240 hertz on your graphics card's probably pretty low unless the game's really easy to run and you have a 4090 or 7900 XTX, you might be able to do that. So how bad is it at 120 hertz? It's not terrible, but it certainly gets a lot worse. Now you might be wondering, is there any affordable VA panel that, you know, has okay response time? And actually, yes, there is, at least according to our teams. We'll talk about that in just a second. So here's the AOC Q27 G3 XMN which is actually only 280 bucks and response time looks pretty good. And this is at OD medium. So we could we could go up to strong if we wanted. This is our team's review. We're going to look at hardware box review this monitor here in just a second. But yeah, overall, the transitions are pretty much all good, again, except for these down here, which seem to be pretty typical of LCD panels. This monitor is actually a little bit weird because if we go down to 120 hertz, it actually gets better. Now these transitions down here specifically got worse, but pretty much everything else got better. And it still has these lightning fast transitions that honestly wouldn't look that weird on an OLED panel. So whoever makes this display, if you could bring these down a little bit, even if you have to bring these up a little bit, this would be a really killer panel and it's affordable. Does it keep getting better at 60 hertz? Well, no, it, it, it gets a lot worse. If you have to run this at 60 hertz, probably don't want to get this monitor. I mean, it wouldn't be the worst thing you get, certainly, but you're going to notice these transitions almost certainly. Okay, so let's take a look at hardware unboxed real quick here. Now they've added a new chart to the mix, which is overshoot. A transition might be really fast, but it might overshoot that color and then have to come back and correct it, or at least that's my understanding of how overshoot works. So like, for example, this transition down here is really fast, but it has to come back and correct it. So that can create what's called inverse ghosting. I don't know if I have any examples that I'll be able to show you of that, but that's something you want to watch out for. If everything over here is green, but everything over here is red, eh, that's not really acceptable. 
So again, this is medium, which our team said was really, really good, but their average response time is 18 milliseconds, not our team's, what was it, like four? See, so yeah, I hear our team said it was 4.5, but hardware on bikes is 18. So somebody got lucky here. Either our team's got a really, really good one, or hardware on bikes got a really, really bad one, or maybe our team's got like a golden sample somehow, and hardware on bikes just got an average one. Now here's a medium at 120 hertz, and the response time, the total response time actually got worse. So they're saying 19 to like, like for example, these transitions up here, they're saying like 30 and 23, but if you check at our things, it's like four and five. That, that's significantly different. I don't know, I don't know if they're using the same testing methodology or equipment, they're probably not. So maybe that explains the discrepancy, I don't know. Okay, let's take a look at strong overdrive, which unfortunately our things did not test at all. So I can't, I can't speak to that. But as we can see here, there's a lot more green over here, significantly improved response time, but it added quite a lot of overshoot in several transitions. So it'd be up to you to decide if this trade-off is worth it. Maybe, and here's strong at 120 hertz, which is again, better, but there's still a lot of overshoot. And now there's actually more overshoot at 120. So hardware and box recommends you run this at strong at 180 hertz, but only medium at 120 hertz, which I think is probably pretty fair. Now I've showed you a bunch of charts, but you might be wondering how does slow response time actually look. So I'm going to show you some screenshots from Blur Busters UFO test. If you go on the website, it'll show the alien and the UFO moving across the screen pretty quickly. And to see this, you'll have to have a camera recording the screen. If you take a screenshot, it's not going to look any different. So here is the AOC Q27 G3X men tested with strong overdrive. As you can see down here in the light background, it actually has very low distortion. The image looks pretty close to how it looks over here on the left. But as we go to a darker and darker background, there's more and more smearing. And here are some other VA panels for comparison. This is the Neo G7 we looked at earlier from Samsung. And this is one of Acer's. I'm not sure what this GP one. They all have pretty low distortion, well, except for this one in the bottom one here with the lightest background but as we go darker and darker it gets you know this is really bad and up here you know this is quite significantly bad as well so this is a problem VA panels have despite showing darker colors better they also have more smearing in those sections now for comparison here is at medium again it's pretty similar now you might be wondering well how does this look if we have an OLED panel you almost can't tell that looks any different from this like right here, this looks like the reference image, just straight up <laughs> at 480 hertz. It looks perfect. <laughs> and over here, there's like a little bit of, you know, a little bit of color shifting, but overall, these OLED panels do a really good job. Actually, this one is a, a TN panel, if I'm not mistaken. So there's what a really good LCD can do. So in my previous video, I recommended getting an IPS monitor for gaming, and have I changed my opinion on that? No, probably not. You could maybe get the AOC Q27 G3 XMN that I mentioned earlier if you want to try something that has local dimming zones and more contrast. But again, it's going to have some smearing, especially in some darker scenes, which is unfortunate because you're probably getting the VA panel to show those dark scenes, and then it's not going to have the best viewing experience in those dark scenes, especially if you move the camera quickly or if some object moves quickly in the dark area. Hopefully in a few years, maybe we'll have some next-gen VA panels that will still have really good contrast and have a mini LED backlight and have a good, better response time. But for right now, again, unless you want to go crazy and buy the Odyssey Neo G9, probably still want to get an IPS panel. And of course, you could look for an IPS panel that has a mini LED backlight, but I recommend you watch your review on them because not all LED backlights behave the same way. Some do pretty well, some have like weird flickering or something, so be careful about that. Thanks for watching and I hope this update was helpful.